I didn't hear the notification, but it looks like it is recording. Welcome to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I am your moderator, Jessica McLean, and I'm emceeing today. So thank you all for joining us for supported inclusive classrooms with an OER instructor learning community. Take it away. Thank you so much. Bear with me just a moment while I share my screen with you all. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on this last day of Open Texas, I hope you've all been able to attend lots of fun sessions. I know that I have, um, and we really appreciate you joining us this morning. My name is Ashley Morrison. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Talker Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. I work with faculty, staff, and students across campus to adopt and develop OER. And I'm joined today by two of my very favorite colleagues, and I will let them each introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Hannah Chapman Tripp. I am the Biosciences Librarian here on campus, but I'm also very engaged and have been for quite some time with OER. Um, I work with you know, faculty, uh, students, and, and grad students in particular um, to support them in areas of the biosciences. It's nice to meet you all. Thanks for coming. And good morning, everyone. I'm Lydia Fletcher. Um, when we were running the um, learning community, I was the physical and mathematical sciences librarian at UT Libraries. Um, and since then, I've moved on to become a research and engineering science in research engineering science associate at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Thank you both for introducing yourselves. We are so excited to share with you today about how we approached the conception, design, and execution of an OER-focused instructor learning community that we ran last fall, in addition to what we learned through the process, the outcomes of our community, and what we're doing moving forward. Um, as Jessica mentioned, you're welcome to share questions in chat as we go, but we intend to save plenty of time for discussion and addressing those at the end. So unless a question is very timely, we'll probably save them for that time. I wanna start by talking briefly about some of the background and history of the instructor learning community at UT. This concept originated in the OER working group that Hannah, Lydia, and I were all a part of at that time. Um, our OER working group is probably similar to those on many campuses um, represented in this session today. It's typically for us a group of about 10 people that includes library staff, faculty, student leaders, and other campus partners. And we develop programming and conduct outreach that attempts to raise the awareness and adoption of OER, um, among other things. Most semesters, we offer one or two workshops that cover a variety of OER topics that might range anywhere from OER 101 and Creative Commons overviews to faculty panels, accessible OER, and more. And these are all standalone workshops, though we do have many instructors who take advantage of multiple. So in late spring 2021, we used one of our meetings in the working group to discuss the possibility of engaging instructors in a deeper, more sustained way through a learning community or learning circle, inspired by the efforts we've seen at other institutions, probably including some of yours. We're very fortunate that our working group includes a staff member from our campus's Center for Teaching and Learning or CTL, and she surfaced a really timely opportunity as part of that discussion. The CTL was in the midst of soliciting applications for a small grant that would support instructor learning communities focused on inclusive teaching practices. Their grant is designed to build instructor capacity for supporting an inclusive campus climate through their teaching, um, and they awarded uh, for projects that assembled small groups of instructors to discuss and learn together about inclusive teaching and learning practices. And because inclusivity and equity have always been central to the way that we position OER at UT, it seemed like a great fit for us. The catch, of course, was that applications were due in about a week from the time we were discussing it, so we needed to move fast. Uh, fortunately, we were able to collectively draft and submit an application on time, and we were very happy to be awarded one of those grants. The grant provided us with $2,500 to spend on whatever we might need to support the instructor learning community, which we'll refer to as the ILC throughout this presentation. We plan from the outset to allocate almost all of those funds for participant stipends to be awarded upon completion of requirements that you'll hear more about later. Initially, we felt this was important for two reasons. 
First, we thought it might be necessary to attract anyone to apply to the ILC, um, but we also thought it was meaningful to recognize the time and effort that participants would put into making the most of the experience. The grant terms also specified that we'd need to deliver the ILC before the end of 2021, which was a much tighter timeline than we'd anticipated. We thought we'd have almost a year to get ready. Instead, we had the summer to prepare. So Hannah, Lydia, and I got to work. Before we could do anything though, what we really needed to do was align on our goals as the facilitators of the ILC. I already mentioned that this concept was intended to extend the typical programming that we offer. Workshops hosted by the OER working group typically engage anywhere between 20 and 40 attendees, but engagement is generally a little limited in a 90 minute virtual event. Through the ILC, we hoped to be able to engage community members more by limiting the number of participants and meeting consistently over the course of six weeks. We'd use some of the content that we often use in bigger workshops, but we'd be able to expand on it and go deeper into many topics. We also thought that the cohort model might encourage more active engagement by allowing participants to develop relationships with new colleagues and introduce them to people and ideas outside of their discipline. We also thought about what we wanted to happen after the ILC concluded. For us, success would mean that at least some of the participants adopted OER and other no-cost materials and that they continue to be engaged as part of the community of practice on our campus. Ideally, some would become champions and advocates who are willing to talk to their colleagues about OER or join us at events or other promotional opportunities. So this is where I take over. Um, we wanted, uh, when we were developing the learning community, we agreed upon these learning objectives because we really thought that they um, aligned with what we were going for, with what our goals would, would be. Um, so the learning objectives were to understand the spectrum of affordable learning materials available openly or through campus or UT library services, obviously with an emphasis on open uh, educational resources. Um, we wanted participants to gain the ability to search for OER that might be relevant to the courses that they taught um, in one or more repositories and evaluate them using open rubrics. Uh, we wanted to give them the skills to be able to evaluate course materials for basic accessibility um, and cultural responsiveness. And we wanted them to be able to identify opportunities to enhance those aspects of OER um, and in, in OER and also in course materials that they themselves were creating. Um, and we wanted them to be able to identify and interpret open licenses associated with OER um, that were created by others um, in the hopes that they would understand what they could or couldn't do with the materials that they wanted to use in their classes, how they could or could not adapt them, um, but also to teach them those topic, those um, uh, how to interpret those licenses so that they could apply them to their own works that they were creating. Um, these were based not only on the requirements of the grant that we received, um, obviously it had, um, uh, it was really uh, interested in pushing the inclusivity, um, which we took to interpret not only um, accessibility um, and the ability for people with disabilities to access things, um, but also cultural responsiveness and uh, increasing the diversity of materials or the diversity of representation of people in the materials. Um, as well as the experience, we also drew on the experiences of the uh, OER working group at UT Austin um, that, you know, we had all gained in designing these workshops over the years um, prior to the ILC. Um, and so, next slide. <laughs> Uh, these learning objectives really paid, really played a huge part in how um, we wanted to um, select the topics, align the topics, um, and design the assignments over the course of the ILC. Um, so here on the screen, we've got a screenshot of part of the schedule that we put together. And um, thank you, Ashley. Uh, she's sharing the uh, link to the full syllabus, which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit. Um, in my part of this presentation, um, people are welcome to look at it. This is the open version that we're making available for people to, you know, use and draw on for their own uh, ILCs or learning communities or, or just for your information. Um, 
when we were setting this out, we really wanted to create a dynamic and meaningful experience for the participants in the ILC. And so we opted for kind of a multimodal approach um, that combined homework reading as well as, you know, homework videos for viewing, um, in-class lectures and activities and assignments that we wanted people to work on outside of the ILC uh, sessions. Uh, in addition to the mandatory meeting times that we had each week, we also offered office hours so that folks could come ask us questions and we could answer them. Uh, we could continue having discussions if there was a topic that people particularly wanted to keep, um, you know, keep talking about. Um, and, and we also wanted it to kind of function as a dedicated co-working time uh, when ILC attendees could come in and work on their assignments, get clarification about the assignments um, and kind of just have a dedicated space to be thinking about these topics. Uh, in laying out our syllabus for the six-week community, our emphasis was really on ensuring that there was a thematic flow um, of the topic so that each, each session's content built on the content of previous weeks. Um, our goal was to provide a really high-level overview of key OER topics that would enable participants to develop confidence in evaluating and selecting OER for their classes. Uh, and we began by introducing, you know, kind of in a general way, what OER are and what their benefits are um, and what they can be for both educators and students. Uh, from there, we moved into talking about finding and evaluating OER and understanding and interpreting open licenses. Because inclusivity was a key focus for our ILC, we spent, uh, we dedicated one session to really exploring how OER contributes to inclusivity through both, as I mentioned, um, accessibility issues and, um, you know, cultural responsiveness. Uh, and we finished the ILC out with um, some information about authoring and sharing tools. Uh, one area of concern that we had when we were designing the syllabus was trying to balance topic breadth and depth. Uh, we anticipated that ILC participants would have a range of exposure levels to OER in general, and we wanted to accommodate people who were both like really new to this topic and had very little interest or very little previous experience with it, um, while providing enough substance for people that had more familiarity so that they felt like they were getting some benefit from their time investment. Uh, it was important to us to maintain a certain amount of flexibility in our schedule as well so that we could shift topics around, extend discussions, or include new topics requested by the cohort. Um, and this enabled us to be really responsive to the requests of the cohort and to be able to shift the uh, focus of presentations as necessary. And this was actually something that we ended up doing kind of midway through um, when we realized that we were having longer discussions and we were kind of running over in different sections of um, each session. And so we were kind of bumping things further down. And luckily we had originally planned for the last week to kind of be um, content light and much more focused on kind of wrapping up um, and, and leaving the sixth week, the final week kind of open like that allowed us to kind of move things down and, and build in more time for discussions because we found that to be um, something that was uh, very important to our attendees. Next slide. So it, when we were talking about how we wanted to create effective assignments for the learning community, we knew that we wanted the requirements for the stipend to include the completion of something meaningful, um, as well as attendance at mandatory meetings. Uh, it was important to us that the assignments we asked the participants to undertake were not burdensome, so we didn't want them to have to spend too much time outside of the ILC dedicating, you know, work that they could be spending on teaching their actual classes or doing research or things like that. Um, and it was important to us that the assignments we asked them to, uh, to do also further their engagement with OER. Uh, and so what we ended up with was um, a course mapping exercise, two evaluation activities using rubrics um, and a sharing activity. The course map mapping exercise um, asked participants to utilize part or all of an existing syllabus as the basis for finding and evaluating OER options. Our goal was to get the ILC members to evaluate OER and other no-cost options that they might choose to replace commercial learning materials with in their course. Um, so we, pro we provided a template for the course map, um, but we allowed the ILC attendees to choose whether they wanted to use it to explore options for an entire course um, or just focus on one unit or learning objective. Uh, participants were required to, to complete the course map and sharing activities to receive the stipend that we offered them. The two evaluation activities approach different aspects of OER. Um, the first rubric, uh, which 
is um, a, a part of a screenshot of it is on the left hand side of the screen, and you can also find it linked from the syllabus that we shared uh, a minute ago. Um, the first rubric was created to kind of be an overall evaluation of the usefulness of a specific OER for the participant needs for their class. Um, so it covered OER topic breadth and accuracy, quality, student engagement, cultural responsiveness, and licensing. And it also included a short section on accessibility, but we asked participants to engage more specifically with evaluating accessibility by using a rubric that was created by Affordable Learning Georgia. The final assignment for the ILC was a sharing activity. Uh, so members could choose from several different options for this, from writing a blog post to applying an open license to a learning object that they already created uh, and sharing it in an OER repository. Um, we didn't want this activity to feel overwhelming, um, but it was important to us to underscore the importance of sharing um, to the OER ecosystem. And so, you know, particularly in getting their colleagues engaged, uh, contributing to the OER ecosystem, you know, things like that. Next slide. Uh, so we decided when we were putting the uh, learning community together that we wanted to um, utilize Canvas, uh, which is the learning management system that's used here at UT Austin. Uh, you can see a screenshot of our um, Canvas page on the right. Uh, this is the screenshot of the public version, but it's obviously got the UT branded Canvas look to it. Um, I think if you actually go to the link to the uh, the public version, it's it's in just the normal OER Commons uh, UI. Um, so we chose Canvas um, because we knew we wanted a space to collect everything together, and it made sense to go with Canvas because it's um, something that the community members who were mostly UT Austin faculty were already familiar with and were visiting several times a week, if not several times a day. Um, Canvas allowed us to organize the content in discrete modules, and you can kind of get a sense of that in the screenshot where you can see that like week one is kind of all grouped together, um, which, you know, was really helpful for us to be able to say, okay, here's the agenda document, here's a homework document, which I think in that case was the rubric. Um, that was shown on the previous slide, um, a link to a discussion hub where people could ask questions or give feedback or, you know, just continue to have a discussion offline. Um, as well as an external link to um, a, um, the, the presentation that we actually gave during the class. Um, we also, um, I don't think you can see the link on the public version because it was something that we used, um, you know, that we did not intend to share as part of the, uh, as part of the learning community. Um, but we had a community notes document uh, in which we encouraged participants to contribute their notes and their personal reflections on the content each week. Um, and so that was something that we were able to link to from each week as well, each week's module. Another reason that we decided to use Canvas was that we knew going into the ILC that we wanted to create a public version of our resources and to publish that. Um, and make it available for other people to adopt at their institutions. And so Con Canvas gave us a really um, yeah, kind of easy way to do that by publishing a public version of the course to Canvas Commons. Um, so we were able to take the materials that we'd created, apply open licenses to them, and then put them in this Canvas shell, put it in Canvas Commons, and then allow other folks from the community to find it and copy it into their home Canvas installation version. Um, so that really aligned, you know, with our goal of um, sharing what we had done, contributing back to the community, emphasizing for our members that, you know, this is an important element of OER. Um, and also by making our materials available, we were hoping that other institutions would be able to use them to jumpstart OER advocacy programs, workshops, things like that at their own institutions, which plays right back into um, that primary goal that we had of promoting inclusivity through open resources. And now I will hand it off to Hannah. Thank you, Lydia. Let me make sure we're on the right page. Great. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about building the community now. Uh, and that, of course, uh, starts with the recruiting and selection uh, process of participants. So in recruiting applicants, um, in order to get the word out, we really relied upon networks of li uh, liaison librarians, um, several campus newsletters, email lists, and the community of OER advocates that we had already been building on campus through years of running workshops um, 
So that was quite successful, um, but we ended up devising an application form in Qualtrics for interested parties to fill out. And this form wasn't too long because we didn't want to make it too arduous or scary, you know, to just fill out the application form. But it did ask some key questions that were going to be important to us in decision making. So one of our goals um, in this community uh, makeup was to have a broad representation of applicants from different departments on campus. We also prioritized a community in which multiple levels of instructors were represented. So all the way from you know, your grad student instructors to lecturers, to tenured faculty, uh, et cetera. So we wanted to target areas um, as well of potentially high impact. And what this looked like practically was assessing the costs already associated with the course um, for the materials in place, as well as instructor readiness to move to OER materials. So another component that we discussed were the enrollment levels of courses from the previous year. And this is purely from a practical point of view. So this could help us in discerning an applicant's potential impact in terms of cost savings for students, if needed. Now, this really wasn't a simple metrics-based process, um, but I think it really did benefit us to have all of that information available as we were going through the decision-making process. It was also somewhat important to us that instructors had a high degree of autonomy over the course materials that were used in their classes. So we made this clear in the call for applications. Um, and while we would have loved to include more uh, you know, TA level um, folks, we really wanted um, folks that would have the opportunity to actually change the materials in their classes. So during the applicant review, uh, we reviewed the applications uh, stripped of any personally identifying information. So I don't believe we saw names, but we did examine the home department, uh, the classes they are responsible for teaching, um, the plans to integrate OER within the next year, some current required course materials costs, uh, and enrollment levels. So in addition, we also had a free text question, which allowed us to identify objectives in applying to the ILC and get a sense of their familiarity with OER and the open landscape. Um, so our response uh, for the first run of the community, uh, we had applicants that outnumbered our ideal target number of participants. And what this suggested to us uh, was that the program uh, which was a deeper learning experience with a higher level of continued engagement was indeed a desired component of OER development here on campus. So this meant that ultimately we did need to have some tough conversations uh, about who to make offers to and why. And ultimately those difficult decisions were made primarily based on the departmental representation of applicants. Though we didn't uh, need to rely too heavily on the criteria that we developed, I think that we are all glad that we spent time developing it because it can be very hard to try and make unbiased determinations about who to accept in those instances. So we did discuss the potential of inviting all applicants into the program, but ultimately determined that if that we did want to cap it at 10 participants to ensure that the cohort experience uh, remained a strong one and that each participant would have the opportunity to share and start discussions um, in the required session each week. So the cohort ended up having a very strong representation from the languages, uh, but we did have a good mix of departments represented, including mathematics, uh, advertising, uh, music, chemistry, Asian studies and classics in addition to the languages. So it was a good mix of different instructor levels uh, that we had hoped for. Um, and there were also se several applicants that we did need to turn down, uh, but we made the decision to offer them spots in the intended run of the ILC the following year or 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So in facilitating um, the learning community, um, we 
Initially, during that planning phase uh, over the summer of 2021, we were quite optimistic that we could meet in person for at least some of the meetings. Of course, little did we know that the COVID-19 pandemic had some other plans. Uh, so once we had the composition of the cohort in place, uh, we did a survey of all the participants and determined from that survey that not only was Zoom preferred as the primary uh, meeting venue, um, meeting mode, but for several of the participants, that virtual participation would be a key component to their participation due to distance and time constraints uh, with other standing commitments, which included their classes, which we of course wanted them to be able to get to and to teach. So this wasn't too much of a pivot from what we had initially planned. Um, and it turned out to be quite successful when conducted virtually, but it did make us glad that we had stuck at the cap of 10 participants. Um, some cohort, um, some, excuse me, some concerns that we'd had initially about engagement possibilities between cohort members proved not to be an issue. Um, and also some other tools that we used to keep in touch with members um, were a set of Google documents, uh, post session email reminders, which Al uh, Ashley diligently sent out, and of course the Canvas course. And as Lydia mentioned earlier, uh, several homework assignments were incorporated, like using a rubric to evaluate a found or personally created OER for its content features, and using an accessibility rubric to evaluate an OER. So to obtain the associated stipend, we were requiring completion of several final objectives. And these were completion of a course map to associate OER or free materials with predefined learning objectives uh, for that class or a timeline of the content delivery for the class in question. A second was one sharing activity, which could be broadly interpreted. This could be an openly, um, openly licensing and sharing a learning object that you've already created in an OER repository or a proposed alternative. So we wanted to leave that really open to the community uh, to decide individually. Also required was attendance of five of the six weeks of the ILC mandatory meetings. So the majority of participants that we had did complete all of these objectives to earn the associated small stipend. And even those who didn't end up completing the assignments uh, and who were in regular communication about their workload and time constraints did attend a majority of the required sessions and were very active participants in discussion regardless of their completion status and goals. So some of our experience as facilitators, um, I think we can say without a doubt, we immensely enjoyed this experience to build a cohort and work with them over multiple weeks to develop a deeper understanding of OER. And we made it clear from the outset that rather than viewing us as OER experts, um, that this would be a learning experience for the facilitators as much as it would be for the participants. So I can say for each of us that we really learned so much and built connections with instructors that we might not have had the opportunity to forge otherwise. It's also highly important uh, in this process not to make assumptions about what instructors know. The level of familiarity with open resources uh, when participants entered the ILC did vary quite a bit, uh, but the course was well paced and met most participant needs. So we also took several temperature checks to evaluate kind of how things were going. And if there was content that the cohort wanted to see in the syllabus that wasn't already included. And through this experience, we ended up adding a new lesson on authoring platforms for OER, uh, which did require some shifting around of other content. So Overall, we valued a more engaged working group and getting to know each other and our diverse strengths and areas of expertise over the course of the community. But we will do some things differently. Uh, so we are planning to run the ILC again this fall, um, but with a mostly different makeup of facilitators. Much of the content is already created and will be reused, uh, but we are trying several things a bit differently. So, 
The office hours component of our first run was not very successful. Uh, it was attended a few times, uh, but I think instructors didn't know necessarily what to bring to the office hours, as opposed to points that they might just have during discussion in the mandatory session. So we are maintaining office hours this year, though we plan to vary the times and dates a little more to allow for more attendance based on their schedules and offer some ideas weekly um, as targets in, in the progress of their project where they might request guidance from a facilitator. Uh, we are also aiming for a more flipped classroom and uh, active learning approach this year, uh, as we heard requests uh, for more activities loud and clear from our uh, feedback that we gained. We are also revising some of the activities based on the feedback, uh, which you can find at the, um, in the graph at the top right of this slide. So despite our best efforts, it did end up being somewhat lecture heavy, which I think we're trying to move away from more this year. So we're also consciously infusing the entire ILC with inclusive practices um, so that we won't just have a single day designated around inclusive practices, but rather it can be an overarching theme that consistently reoccurs throughout the content and the discussions. So we are also experimenting with a choose your own adventure final project, wherein a participant can determine if they want to plan to adopt or adapt an OER or to create a new OER. And this is a result of many discussions that we had held internally. And ultimately, we had decided that much of the content um, of the course is highly similar for those uh, creating and those adopting OER. It just needs to be framed in a slightly different way. For example, an activity in using an OER repository can help identify potential OER to use for those who do plan to adopt, but it can also be a useful exercise in familiarizing oneself with the landscape of already existing OER and doing somewhat of a gap analysis uh, for those who plan to create new OER. Another change we would make uh, is the stipends, uh, which is a little hard for me to say, um, but it was um, something of a bonus to have, you know, a monetary incentive for completing the ILC. Um, but the stipends involved way more administrative overhead than I think any of us had foreseen. And because the amount of money ended up being, you know, quite small when divided across the participants, it likely wasn't a primary driver to apply for or to complete the requirements of the course. So in the end, uh, we deemed the financial award not worth it. And if we did have a similar amount of money again, I think we would almost certainly choose to spend it in a different way, such as providing a breakfast for everyone or funding an outside speaker. Um, as for the participant experiences, uh, many of the changes are largely based on participant feedback, uh, which was overall positive, but did give us further insight into changes we might make to improve the ILC experience. So to gather this feedback, we had created an anonymous Google form, including content-based questions, a timing and logistics questions, and questions targeting the overall experience, uh, learning and implementation plans. So as you'll see in a figure at the bottom right of the screen, uh, as of December 2021, 80% of the respondents planned to adopt or uh, ad adopt, excuse me, OER or other no cost resources uh, as course materials. Next slide, please. So next I'll talk briefly about the progress that we've seen since the conclusion of the ILC. So on the screen, you'll see a few visual examples of the required sharing activity. Many of the participants chose to share openly, um, chose to openly license and share in a repository. And these were mostly things that they'd already created. Um, and they mostly chose OER Commons, which was demonstrated in one of the sessions. Um, however, we did have an alternate methods of sharing as the center image, uh, which is a screenshot of the UT Libraries blog, where a faculty member was interviewed regarding the experience of the ILC and OER in their field. 
So since the ILC has ended, uh, we have seen successes in a variety of forms. But because some of the participants uh, from the first ILC were already interested in adopting OER, it's hard to say that the current um, adoption rate is a direct result of our efforts. We have, however, seen successes that we can enumerate, such as you know, one instructor has moved two of their classes to entirely OER materials. We also had two ILC members who went on to apply for and receive fellowships from the UT libraries for adopting and one for creating OER. Uh, we also had two separate participants uh, who are in the process currently of co-authoring an OER textbook, which is a huge undertaking. So all of these examples and continued engagement with the libraries and OER are evidence for us of a successful program. Uh, and now I will hand it over to Ashley. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so from the outset of planning the ILC, as we mentioned before, we knew that it was really important to us to make all of our materials available openly to the extent possible. And because we used Canvas to facilitate our program, we were able to apply a Creative Commons license very easily and deposit our course into Canvas Commons. Um, and if you don't use Canvas as your learning management system, that's okay. Uh, Canvas Commons is available to anyone who wants to create a free account and you can export the common cartridge or take what you like and upload it somewhere else. And I wanna give you a quick tour of what we've been able to make available. I am also sharing in chat right now, a link to this Canvas Commons course. So let me jump in. So Lydia gave a great preview of this already. I'm gonna zoom in just a bit. Uh, our course is organized by modules that correspond to the weeks we covered the content, but um, we acknowledge that you might prefer to present concepts in a different order and can rearrange it as you'd like. You'll find our notes and suggestions for facilitators of similar communities in the README. Sorry, the Zoom bar came up over the one thing I wanted to click on. Let's see if I can get to it. There we go. <laughs> Um, you would probably delete this if you made it available on your own campus. Um, you'll also find that our syllabus, which we shared a link to later, includes a schedule um, and also our community norms and expected behaviors linked right at the top of that. For each week, we've included an agenda, homework that's due by the next time the community meets, a discussion space and any materials we present to uh, participants by that week. And except where otherwise noted, all presentations and content are licensed CC, BY, NC, SA. And I'll give you just a quick peek at what that looks like. So meeting agendas are pretty straightforward. We include the major topics and subtopics and roughly how much time each of those topics took us. So your mileage may vary. We found that we went over um, just as often as not uh, because we were chatty, but that is a, um, a pivot as Hannah mentioned that we intend to make next time to integrate more of a flipped classroom approach. We also have suggested homework for each week with instructions on how to uh, complete that homework. Um, we did not, outside of um, checking for completion of the major assignments at the very end of the course, we didn't check in on their progress each week to make sure they were following it. We trusted them to get it done on the timeline that made sense for them, but we did want to give them guidance on what a reasonable time to complete each step might be. I mentioned that we have discussion hubs and that we've included presentations in all of these cases. So you can see, for example, a preview of a presentation that Hannah gave in our first week to outline affordable content options and benefits, which had a real emphasis on OER, but was not exclusive to OER. Um, we included instead really a spectrum of affordability and talked about the relative benefits and drawbacks of each of those before we dedicated really the rest of the community to talking about OER. We also use Canvas as a place for participants to submit their final assignments and for us to mark them as complete, which I mentioned. Um, so this is part of what was required to receive the stipend and it was really nice to have it all organized in one place. If you made a copy of this and you were using Canvas, you would see uh, buttons for participants to submit their completed assignments. So we hope that others might be able to reuse the content that we've created for this community. And we're also in the process, as Hannah said, of revising it and refining it for a second round of the ILC that will go live 
next month in October. And we'll be glad to share those revisions and new content once they've been tested out and ready for public consumption. So that includes our planned presentation. We're gonna move into Q&A now, but I do wanna mention and point out that you'll have access to this content. And we've also compiled a list of our relevant resources at the end of our slides. Um, so I would love to start by checking chat for any questions that may have come up while we were speaking. But if you have something you'd like to ask, please feel free to drop your questions there, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and we'll call on you from there. I saw early in the presentation that there was a question about office hours and how effective they are. And I think that ended up being addressed by Hannah, but if anyone has follow-up questions on that, please let us know. Any other questions? Or if you here have experiences running a uh, instructor learning communities, learning circles, communities of practice on your own campus and want to share what those experiences like, we, we certainly welcome that too. Well, there may not be any questions and that's okay if so. I do want to share a link to our slides here so that you have access to all of this after you leave today. Um, I'm happy to stick around for more minutes in case you wanna ask something off the record, but perhaps we can stop the recording. Thank you so much for that great presentation. You will stop the recording now, but please feel free to stay and ask questions if you have them. <laughs> 